Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the news behind the news of Rafkin Tav on Mix 94.7 FM. Thank you for joining me on today's program. This afternoon, I'm joined here with a uh, soon to be world renowned chef, <laughs> and that is Miss Tracy Bladen. Tracy, how are you doing? Thanks for being on the program. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. Okay, great. So, um, like many of us, you know, we um, browse through social media and we see. You know, different people who would share their creations and stuff and, and <laughs> particularly I always look forward to some of the things you share because um, the process itself you know is uh, well put together but of course the final results is you know something worth look looking like it, it's worth having um, and you know uh, it's not that often you meet someone who becomes a chef besides people who just love cooking yeah. uh, so I think that's also pretty cool uh, so as we start with the interview then can you tell us a bit about yourself and uh, in particular, uh, what are some memories that you cherish about growing up in Samantha? Okay, so do I go in depth or just give like... You could, you could go in depth. That's, okay. that's what it's all about. <laughs> so I was born and raised on Samantha, uh, the daughter of Faye Blyden, but also the late Alfonso Blyden. Mm -hmm. And um, pretty much started at the Jolly Dwarf Kindergarten, went on to System the Primary School. After that, uh, did a Havo Bebeo in Milton Peters College. And then that's where I decided to take that leap and pursue culinary. So I went to Johnson & Wales uh, North Miami campus in Florida, which unfortunately yeah, does not exist yeah. anymore, but it's still there. And yeah, that's where I spent four years working on a culinary arts associates and a bachelor's in food service management. And then me being an overachiever, I happen to have a minor in bacon and pastry arts, hmm. but also event management. Oh, okay, cool. Added on to that. Okay. And then from there, you know, with connections and being good with a lot of the chefs there, I managed to get my first job, which happens to be, which happened to be in Germany. Hmm. So I started working for a ski and health resort. Um, at the time, I didn't know that existed, but it's five star plus. Wow. So, worked there for four years, and then I decided, okay, I need a change. I need a change of pace because it was very slow living at the time. Ah, so it wasn't fast pace. It was in the mountainside. So ah, okay, I got you. So, okay. Personally, so I kind of reserved and yeah. got you. Got you. And I just needed to be surrounded by more cuisines. So, I decided to skip on over to the Netherlands mm -hmm. because I have the Dutch passport, so why not? And yeah, currently now uh, I'm working at a restaurant called Yerba and it's a uh, plant forward. So it's very sustainable. Okay. And I would say the cuisine itself is fusion. We take a lot of inspiration from like Asian to Middle Eastern to even like local cuisine. Mm -hmm. And then we just put our take on it. And yeah, it's fully plant-based. Based where? Uh, in Amsterdam. Okay, nice. And fully plant-based. So we try to put more emphasis on the vegetables. And then for our meat eaters, they do have the option to add protein to it, but it's more focused on the veg. Okay. All right, so I appreciate the in-depth response because now I'm going to... Uh, chip away at some stuff that you said <laughs> uh, the first thing being um, which I think is pretty interesting is the fact that uh, you know you beyond besides culinary arts itself you, you added some other factors to your study which I think is brilliant because one it, it's something that will make you stand out you know to whether it's an employer or an investor mm -hmm. um, but also because <clears throat> by adding on the they said bakery and um, yeah, bacon and pastry. Yeah, and pastry, yes, along with the events management. Yeah. I think it's great because, you know, the work that you feel that you're in, you know, also deals with um, to serve people. But um, besides providing the, the good, mm -hmm. you know, the service is a okay. sometimes more challenging part because you're dealing with people in um, expect, unexpected events. So, you know, with baking there, or cooking, there can be mishaps, but you can pretty much... Like ninety nine percent control, you know everything yeah. to the end result. <laughs> exactly. But with events management and so forth, that in itself was a challenge because you deal with humans that yeah. you cannot control. <laughs> so, um, I think one thing there is how was it in terms of I guess 
deciding that you know you will all be to Germany. Did you have any um, offers in, in the U.S. itself in the region, or was it just a, like a leap of faith? And did you have any doubt being that far as well? So how was that? So basically, I guess my whole like school career was a whole a big leap of faith. Um, seeing where I went to Vireo at the time, so people usually expect you to study things like law medical you know those economics more, or something you know, yeah <laughs> higher up things and at that age i didn't know basically what i was doing now would really set me up in a place that i'm happy for the decisions i made but i really just wanted to do something that i enjoyed and then at the time i was just like hey um i was helping my dad with his catering business um, my mom, she did cakes at home, and yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it. So I was just like, oh, let me go study something that I like, you know? Yeah. Not what was expected of me. Correct. So and you never got that pressure as well from your parents to... No, okay. like secretly my father was really excited <laughs> that I did something that he was doing already. Mm -hmm. and I could imagine. Mm -hmm. Apparently that runs within his side of the family as well because mm -hmm. my grandmother used to bake cakes, did snacks as well. My uncle, also a big time chef back in the day. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like proceeding in that like family legacy yeah. when it came to cooking. So for me, I had... A set plan where I was just like okay my first year is just going to see like yo, do you really like this Tracy can you really do this and then if not I didn't tell my father if not then I'll just transition to something else but um, yeah ended up doing the first year got really into it and then just let it flow and from there like it opened so much doors and yeah as you continue to work in the field it's more, a lot less about the cooking. That's like just a skill that you just learn, but it's like how we say interpersonal skills, mm -hmm. how to network, how to put yourself out there, how to keep those contacts, but also like a lot of it is basically is just the customer experience at the end of the day. Yeah. Like the customer could have like a mediocre steak, but at the end, if you show that customer like, hey, this person was very attentive, showed me the um, attention I needed, answered my questions, it can really change that perspective of their experience at the end of the day. So, yeah, it was just basically just jumping in and just going for it. Going to Germany, like, right at the end of college, um, I got the offer because I did my internship there. Oh, okay. And the guy was okay. just like, hey, we had such a great time working with you. I want to come to Germany. And I was just like, hey, you know, that's a job opportunity right after college. I don't have to worry. Mm -hmm. Me not knowing that much German, not really being that aware of like European life, what yeah. to expect. Mm -hmm. So it was just like, hey, you know what? Go for it. Why not? And yeah. if, if you crash and burn, you know, you... You can always come back home. Exactly. <laughs> you can always come back home, so, sure. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, I guess, yeah, I never, I was scared, yeah, but it was just, I was just like, okay, if I don't do it, then I was going to have that, like, what if. What yeah, what, if. yes, correct. And I think, yeah, it's definitely something worth it because, you know, yeah, everyone has different um, after school uh, stories. You know, some people get jobs immediately, some don't. Um, but I think even uh, and as you shared, you know, it's it's, it's okay to go for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I think what helps with that is being prepared for for life um, in itself. Of course, um, you will grow to learn more, but having a, a foundation will, will give you that security to know that hey, you know, I could I could I could overcome this challenge. And I mean, like I must say, I am privileged to say that I had a dad who didn't take no for an answer. Like he was. You know what? If this is our goal, we're going to go and get it. And, yeah, I just happened to be, like, in the right room with the right people. So all of that just Everything played. worked out. Yeah. Yeah. So um, one of the questions, curios curiosities I had was, um, you know, going to um, – so studying culinary arts, um, besides cooking, what else would you say – well, what else do you learn, you know, at such an academic level? I ask that because I'm curious if you're also taught – um, 
how to like run a restaurant or is it just limited to just tr cooking different meals so so I have to talk I have to say back in those days because the curriculum has changed mm -hmm. because cooking has evolved as well too so back in the days um, so you have the first two years are basically dedicated to the basics so you have fundamentals you have stocks and sauces you have fabrication so how to break down a chicken how to break down an entire cow fish and yeah basically learning the skills and then when you go on to food service management that's where you really learn like okay how do i set up a business how do i set mm -hmm. up a concept you know and then you have your basic economic ca classes and yeah you pretty much get into the mindset of a business owner. But the real learning comes into when you actually go into the field, you know. And, um, yeah, my first years of working in the industry was basically dedicated to just like, okay, how do I improve my skill? How do I learn these tips, these quick, fast, you know, fast little tricks to just improve my time management, my efficiency when it comes to the craft? And then... <clears throat> the last three years is when I really developed, okay, Tracy, you're not going to be in the kitchen that long. Eventually, you grow out of it, and you have to own your own place. So that's where I was really interested in learning the different aspects of the restaurant. Okay, mm -hmm. I need to go to the other side. I need to learn how to manage a floor. I need to know, okay, what goes into setting up this restaurant? Because um, thanks to where I'm working now, I learned that everything has a reason. How the chairs are put in place has a reason. Like each square foot of this restaurant has to be making Maximize. money. Mm -hmm. So just learning that and then also learning, okay, how do you add, how do you upsell your experience to, you know, um, by adding certain services like wine pairings. How do you bring up that value as well? And then also also to how do you lead a team you know how do you put them on yeah. the same page and yeah advocate like what you see what your vision and hope that they share that same vision as Correct. well so yeah like you learn a lot in culinary school you learn the lingo but like it really comes in when you go into the field and actually do the work yeah and then some people yeah they remain just like cooking out of like yeah you love to cook but then also sometimes you just have to step out of that and be like okay now i really have to think business yeah, minded yeah. like what do i want to do because i guess the thing there is to uh, be able to in a sense replicate yourself because you know the moment let's say you're just ill like you're absolutely tired you can't go in what happens <laughs> <laughs> i mean i i have had a lot of those days and then it's just having to remind yourself, like, okay, at the end of the day, I really enjoy, well, I could only speak for myself. Mm -hmm. I enjoy expressing myself with food. How I express myself is through my experiences, what I've seen, how I could relate certain aspects of one culture's cuisine to mine and just bring it and present it to a customer and see how they react on it, like, I always say one of the best um, compliments I could ever get on a dish is when somebody says, wow, this reminds me of home. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can you know? imagine, yeah. And once I do that, like, that's where I come from. Like, yeah. that, <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. what, that's what inspires me to, like, you know what? I have a reason for this. I'm going to keep on going. Yeah, because like I say, you know, home is where the heart is. So yeah. if you can rem remind someone of home, then, uh, yeah, you've, you've won them for life. Exactly. <laughs> Cool. Exactly. So, one of the things I'm curious about too is, uh, what did you what did you learn in the real world? Something you learned in the real world that you you wish you probably learned in school, if there's any. What have I learned in the real world? That, you know, I've had this uh, conversation with a friend recently, and I mean, when you're in culinary school, it it does feel cutthroat because everybody is trying to be like the next you know Renee Redzepi mm -hmm. you know the next uh, Alton Brown you know the next top thing and you tend to beat yourself up 
for it because you want to bring out something new, something innovative, something that really puts you out there. But what I've learned now is that like every dish that I create is not my uh, win or break dish, you know? That's just a next dish added on to my what, repertoire. It's not like if I make this dish, this is going to be the end all say all, you know? Mm -hmm. It's just a next thing just added on to the journey of what I tr I'm trying to create, which is, uh, yeah, a legacy for me, a way to tell my story, how I maneuver through my life, my journey. And, yeah, so not to take things too uh, serious. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, you yeah. don't... You don't Learn it per se in college, but once you go through life, you just be like, hey, you know? Yeah, I got you. Appreciate you sharing that. Um, and even with what you, what you just said about um, creating different dishes and stuff, uh, is there, are you someone who has a particularly favorite cuisine to produce or does it doesn't matter? <laughs> um, it really depends on the moment, the mood. Um, like when I. Um, doing new dishes for the restaurant or just for myself mm, i would tend to gravitate first to what i know of what i've experienced and i do have a lot of gravitation towards asian cuisine but now i'm learning to step aside and you know check other places other cultures that i could somewhat see myself in um like when i went to thailand as part of like a study abroad mm -hmm. for my school what made me really fascinated was like wow like a lot of ingredients that i'm familiar with back home just seeing how they use it how they make it theirs i was just like yo like this is really awesome like i like this like i want to incorporate more of this mm -hmm. into what like i do so and then also being able to bring that to people that never experienced that or probably won't ever be able to experience is how i like to base my cooking on just gotcha. like bringing familiarity but with a twist i got gotcha. you you know yeah that's, so. that's actually brilliant yeah and um with that as well how do you <clears throat> or, or what do you consider when pairing or fusing cuisines Pairing and fusing cuisines. Um, what I consider is I like to bring something familiar and then something like very like Fine. left field. Mm -hmm. A great example, and that's what I've been learning working at this restaurant that I'm at right now is like creating depth, but also not too much where you have your guests like pull back. So a recent dish that I've created was a dessert and it has passion fruit okay but then i add the addition of red bell pepper to it <laughs> for dessert yeah wow okay and so those are the flavors that i was playing with and then while you play with those flavors you're looking for like flavors to back them up so at the end of it all it ended up being a deconstructed uh, passion fruit tart so you have lemon curd you have a uh, oh. sablé crust with a uh, raspberry and red bell pepper sorbet and then a white chocolate whipped ganache to it so you have hints of familiarity with that just like ooh, yeah i would never think of adding those two together that's brilliant so that's where that's the route that i try to always stare towards like familiarity but then also that like surprise factor so. okay you know i guess that's pretty cool because um you know i kind of had a question for you of you know on the creative side like do you ever find it tough to come up with something but i i mean i guess not because i mean there's, al there's there will always be something to, to try i mean <clears throat> i mean yes I do but i guess maybe but because well, you could do it in your personal life, I guess you know to try something for a restaurant is at a different <laughs> different level than you know something for just you a snack for you you know or some friends or something. I mean, I yeah, I can't say it comes off like naturally. It's just based on like how I'm feeling at that moment because sometimes like it would be weeks where I'm just like I can't really 
think or put something together and then maybe 3 a.m. at night and just have that burst of like so you get up and write it down or, yeah write it down no and it yeah like now thanks to like social media you know you have so much chefs sharing their craft on these social platforms so you're just like oh wow like i like what he did with that i gonna keep that in mind so you just have this like inventory of just these small little tidbits of ideas that you want to come back towards and then you just say oh yeah okay he did that with that he did with that, that with that and i always wanted to do a dish with this so let me combine them and see gotcha what happens like gotcha. right now um i guess it has to do also a bit with my dad because we had a project where um i did the cover for a soon-to-be book that he wants to write and nice. it has flamboyance on it and then nice. coincidentally they are in bloom and i was just like hmm are flamboyance edible so right now i'm playing <laughs> around this dish idea that i have where i could incorporate that okay and see what could happen about yeah what could happen because i've done my research you don't see a lot of people using flamboyance in cooking because it's more of a decorational tree but but they are edible i've only seen one person use it <laughs> so i mean it ain't like maybe putting that much that it may harm you <laughs> nah no nah, i don't think so but you yeah. know it also has to have a purpose yes like, to, I got you. in the dish so i, I plan around with it okay. just when you reach the final part i mean Go gladly ahead, volunteer <laughs> myself as a taste tester <laughs> Just putting it out there, <laughs> but um, okay, that's that's pretty cool because um, you know, with with that, I, I, another thing I was curious about too, in addition to the creative side of it, is yeah, I guess even um, researching because you know it's you people have different um, how to say dietary preferences <laughs> and um, you know, and then you have different traditional styles of of making meals and so forth. So I'm curious on how. Do you delve into, let's say, different diet types um, or traditional meals from other places as well? So when, and that's where I'm very sensitive to, especially when it comes to my culture, my cuisine. Um, you really don't want to offend anyone. So a lot of it delves into like, okay, how do these people make it traditionally? How do I do it in a way that doesn't offend someone but speaks more to me? How I perceive it. And then also, yeah, you just want it to be, yeah, you don't want it, you don't want to label something that it's not. So that's where, like, that's where most of my time is focused on, okay, like, if I'm going to take something from somebody's culture, how do I, one, like, put it out there, like, hey, this is not my, I am not the master of it, I can't tell you this and this but this is where the idea originated from inspired by and this is how i would take my take on it how i would make it like something that i could familiarize in gotcha and when it comes to dietary um again <laughs> this past few years <clears throat> oh my god sorry <laughs> this past year i've been mostly focused on plant-based cuisine so mostly vegan so that's where I've been trying to really change how I perceive ingredients and how I could replicate certain um, tastes and feelings that I receive. For instance, eating a piece of meat, how can I translate that, for example, into uh, a cabbage mm -hmm. or stuff like that? Mm -hmm. And I must say, in the last year, I think my cooking has gone way better. Nice because you really have to tap into more different ways of cooking, like fermentation and stuff like that. So, for example, a recent dish that I've done was based on jerk chicken meat s steak. I wanted something to replicate a steak because working in a plant-based <laughs> plant restaurant, you tend to just be eating a lot of vegetables. Yes. And then <laughs> the urge to eat meat does arise. So based on my urge for meat, yeah. I was just like, yo, okay, I want to make something that's relatable to a steak. 
And then I also wanted to, it to relate to me as a Caribbean person. So I said, okay, let's see. Mm, let me look at jerk chicken, the spice and stuff like that. And let me see how I can translate that into a vegetable. And then the first vegetable that really hit me and that was also in season was daikon. For those who don't know what daikon is, it's relative to a radish, very long mm. white vegetable. Daikon, let me Google that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, okay, okay. So I have this daikon. How am I going to make it meaty? So me again searching into like, okay, which cuisine, which culture uses this, and how do they apply this? What cooking techniques do they use to really accentuate it? Then I ended up in. I hope I'm not wrong, uh, Japanese cuisine. They do a uh, yes. daikon steak, and it's just basically daikon that's braised in a broth that <clears throat> makes it tender but also makes it nice and savory. And it cuts down on the spiciness of the daikon. So I was like, okay. I have a base of how I want to go about this. So then that's where, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm going to inject jerk seasoning but I just don't want it to taste like jerk. I want it to mimic meat as well. Mm. So that's where you go into scientifics and see like, okay, what's the main composition of meat? And meat is acidic in a base. So I was just like, okay, how do I mimic that? And then in a lot of plant-based cuisine, we use fermentation to kind of like accentuate that funkiness of acidity. Mm -hmm. So that's where, you know, I started looking into like black vinegar, miso and stuff like that to create that meaty likeness yeah. so yeah. at the end you know i ended up with a product that really like started to look like me it started to have that essence of meat and then played around with sides so then at the end we had a jerk daikon steak with uh rice and peas coconut rice Smart. and peas <laughs> with a plantain espuma and then a Wait. plant, yeah, a plant in a spoon. <laughs> Wait, what's, a spoon? What's that? So pretty much it's like a foam. Mm. So how I create it is just basically stewing or like cooking a plantain, right? Plantain mm -hmm. and a ah, cream. I see. And then making a puree out of it. And then wow. you have these, uh, they call them whipped cream canisters. Yeah, yeah. I have seen it now on, on Google. <laughs> and then you just make it into a nice foam. So to get that essence of, you know, your fried plantain. Yeah. Nice. And then That's I did a uh, jerk and plantain crumb on top with a uh, coriander oil. So, yeah, that basically is how my thought process goes. So, mission accomplished. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you, you actually answered another question I had for you with that, which is, you know, how do you get creative with organic or, you know, uh, vegetables and vegan food? So, so I appreciate that. Um, definitely something i think that would sell well here <laughs> um so we're going to take a quick break and then we'll be right back good afternoon everyone and welcome back to the news behind the news with ralph Gintav on mix 24.7 fm i'm speaking to one of our daughters of the soil miss tracy bladen who is a well-accomplished uh, chef a culinary expert and you know sharing her concepts and her journey with us here on the program so uh, one of the questions I have for you as well in regards to, you know, let's say making the decision to study culinary arts is do you get to specialize in a particular, particular cuisine or do you do that maybe after, after you graduate or something? Um, no, so pretty much to keep it very um, open. So the main focus is to make sure you learn the basic cooking skills and then they do touch in on certain cuisines, like the major cuisines like Asian, since I was in America, American cuisine, but also a bit of Caribbean. And then, yeah, after graduation, you could decide which one you want to specialize in. It's pretty okay. much very broad. And what route do you take? Let's say if I want to specialize in uh, Indian cuisine. Indian cuisine, I would say. Then you, then, like, I guess, is that something that is done... Um, in the field or through an academic institution? Um, we would touch up a, a bit on it in uh, college, but like only a small bit. Maybe one day you cook fully Indian cuisine. But if you say like, hey, I really want to be 
like verse in this, that's where you go. You find your favorite Indian place. Go there, ask like, hey, I really want to learn how to cook it. And gotcha. Yeah. Okay, I was just curious about you know how does that work? Because um, <clears throat> yeah, you know you do have such a uh, varying amount of uh, you know dishes that you can make or, or cultures that. So okay, that's so that's actually good to know. Um, and in, in addition to that. Another thing that I think is would be great to get you to speak on is, you know, sometimes culturally we have misconceptions or falsities that we that we practice, um, you know, passed on just by whatever, re for whatever reason. Um, so when it comes to kitchen, uh, what were you? I mean, sorry, when it comes to cooking, what what would you say are some things that uh, you learn should not be done in the kitchen? <laughs> you put me in the spot because. <laughs> I have to bring it up, I guess. Um, so when you go to culinary school, you do learn uh, the right, um, I would say, the HACCP way of doing things. So pretty much uh, standard ways of keeping your kitchen organized, clean, to meet uh, regulations. But uh, I know in the Caribbean, we have our ways of doing things. Um, one would be like, I know a controversial one is like, washing your chicken. I know a lot of people believe in washing it, lime, vinegar, salt, vinegar, salt yeah. and I totally understand that, definitely. And me, myself, you know, it's in me having to do it. But if you would have to look at it in <laughs> professional terms, um, the concern is the spread of bacteria. and. A lot of people say, like, no, I wear gloves, da 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 And it's all down to, like, okay, the spread. You want to minimize that. And also, too, when you're cooking the meat, basically, you're cooking it to a point where bacteria is killed. It's all basically how you prep and store it. So, yeah, mm. when I was in culinary school, it was very, like, what? This is what I learned. Yeah. But this is what they teach me. Like, <laughs> ah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I must say that, yeah, for me, it's just like a touch and go. I follow what I've learned, but I also tend to just follow the ancestors and <laughs> what I do as well. So it's, I take the best from both. Yeah. And put it together. <laughs> and then any additions to that? Additions to that. Mm, yeah. Additions to that, too, is yeah like what would i say is addition i mean as you go along to the different kitchens that you work in you see different things as mm. well like oh they do it like that understandable or they set it up like that you know how you set your fridge as well you know you have things with like a lower cooking point on top and things with a higher cooking point based the on bottom. the bacteria that you have to cook to mm. the bottom gotcha. so gotcha. like ready to eat products on top Things I need to cook, like fish, meat, on the bottom. Yeah, stuff like that. Okay, gotcha. So, uh, yeah, because uh, I don't know if you ever heard or, or read the this brief parable, I guess I would say, um, of a person who, like how they learned to bake from their, from their mom. But I think the person used to, no, it was, yeah, bake a ham. I think they used to cut it. Yeah, you see, it's to cut it and um, put it in the oven, and then I think the daughter or child asks, "Why do you do that?" And then she found out because her mother did it, and then she went to ask her mother, and then she said, because "Her the mother oven did was it small. exactly because <laughs> the oven was small." <laughs> so that's why I asked that question because you know there's certain things that we may do that we just do it because hey, my mother, some my mother do it, so you know your mother knows everything, right? So yeah. <laughs> you no, just do what your mother does. It's also interesting to see like. Um, Certain things you learn in culinary school that you think like, oh, a lot of people have been doing these things for years. Mm -hmm. Like one example is when um, I went with a friend of mine to Croatia. Nice. Croatia is beautiful. Yes. And I told her like, hey, I know it's only for four days, but I have to cook with your mother. Like no other thing I want to do besides cook with your mom. Mm -hmm. So we just, so she happily invited me into her kitchen and we cooked one of my favorite dishes was sarma which is like a cabbage roll and it's stuffed with a uh, rice and meat mixture inside and then as she was cooking like i was noticing like wow these are a lot of 
techniques that you usually learn with like traditional French cooking and stuff like that. And I asked her like, oh, did your mom do any cooking, school or stuff like that? And she's like, no. Like this is what she learned from her grandmother, her great grandmother. Mm -hmm. This is what she'd been doing forever. And I was like, wow, like it's super interesting to see like certain things that, you know, yeah, commonalities that you mm. think like, oh, you know, like maybe reserve, but actually is yeah, yeah, we, yeah like it's not Universal, only almost. yeah, exactly. So that's one thing I could say like, okay, yeah, I see that. Okay, I could take from like I want to say I don't want to say take from, but that's what I learned in culinary school is just like how you perceive it as well because. What I wish to is that um, they put an emphasis on like classically trained French chef. That's the basis, and then you spread on afterwards. But like, why couldn't why can't Caribbean be like mm -hmm. a staple of like my cook? And why do I have yeah, to be classically fine, fine trained fine French and, and so then forth. decide yeah. to correct <laughs> you know venture into other stuff? So yeah. That's where I was just like, okay, you know what? So I guess that just kind of shows you dominance in terms of, you know, um, yeah, uh, decolonization of education, I would say. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and part of that too is because, um, yeah, just ask yourself then maybe who, who are the largest people groups in the world? Maybe that should be, you know, uh, more practiced or learned. But, but yeah, such is life. <laughs> um, but another thing that I had, though, kind of tying into that is, you know, I'm curious about how is it working alongside people from other backgrounds, and would you say it posed a challenge at any given moment for you, or uh, was it simple? Mm, I would say for me, um, I think I'm very approachable in that sense where I'm always eager to learn from someone, see how they do it. So going to a very diverse school in Miami gave me that taste of like okay like I in a place where a lot of people go and probably do things different than I do and I was just always eager and curious to know okay why why you do it like this why is it like that so I guess that pretty much prepared me for the trajectory that my life would take me um, when I moved to Germany that was more of like a big culture shock because one Europe is not the same as America which is not the same as the Caribbean and just seeing how these different uh, people from these different European countries approach you how they talk to you but also how they interact with food and itself as well so that uh, was also yeah a big thing for me because I was just like yo this is totally different like people ain't as warm and friendly <laughs> you know as on the islands mm -hmm. and stuff like that so it really gave me this sense of like okay if i want to relate to people i have to relate to them in some way that we could find a middle point and that was always food yeah i'd be like oh back home we do this like was your go-to home food and stuff like that sure. and then that's how you create a yeah. connection and yeah that's, that's how that's, you go <laughs> that's part of the um i guess i would say the global approach to to peace yeah. to world peace <laughs> food sports and i forget what the other thing was but food and sports namely yeah. for sure um and oh so even in a professional cell professional um sense um i could imagine that you know let's say in in moments where you're I, in crunch time you're dealing with a high demand for for meals and so forth how do you de how do you maintain your focus and particularly not allowing the, the busyness or the hustle and bustle to break to break you or you know that you can stay committed to finalizing that um that plate so it's a mind state um as a chef you are yeah they perceive you to be someone that's really good under pressure and in all honesty, not everyone <laughs> is the best under pressure, hmm. me, myself included. But uh, I've learned uh, that throughout it, you really just have to have a good sense of like, okay, what am I capable of? And what can I have done in a certain amount of time? Just make it as realistic as possible. 
And also, too, you learn in culinary school mise en place, which means to keep everything in place. So when I go into work, I already start by like, okay, this is what needs to be done. And I also have to make sure I could be do a lot of things at the same time. So it makes the process a little bit smoother because we have like maybe a five hour uh, period to get a restaurant rolling and ready. Mm -hmm. And this is like, we're talking about 70 people at least wow. one night. Wow. So yeah, it's a lot of just organization and then also just making sure you could multitask at the same time but also making sure like it doesn't go in vain of like what you're trying to produce as well like mm -hmm. you're producing the same quality always yeah and that's a key yeah producing the same quality exactly. good quality always <laughs> exactly and also to as a team as well like yeah. i've I've have the privilege to say I've cooked in teams where it just it didn't feel like work, you know, it just felt like fun. Fun the next day with the team. We all, you know, in the same position, so we just really on each other to be like, "Hey, where are you with your prep? Do you need any help? Can I do this for you?" Da -da -da. So a good team also is quite key for sure to being able to produce in such a stressful <laughs> time. Gotcha. And what has culinary arts taught you about our cuisine and the various elements that goes into it? Whew. I must say, um, not to take it for granted at all, because um, every time I come back, that's my goal is just to see, okay, what is the true essence of Samaritan cuisine? Because mm. it really is like you would ask a lot of people, like, okay, was was a true Samaritan plate? Like, and a lot of people would tell you different, different things. things. Yeah, correct. And yeah, you have these certain cultures that also like they have this one identity stuck to them. But um, yeah, like for instance, now I in Holland, and yeah, when you ask a Dutch person, was your plate? Yeah, people would tell you stampot. People would tell you this, and it's just like, oof, okay. Like, that's their stuff. But then when I come home, like, it's just a whole Man, mix. A variation. Mm -hmm. Variation of things. And it's just like, wow. Like, ooh, like, to be blessed to have that, like, local food scene mm -hmm. be so diverse and stuff like that is really, like, a blessing in mm -hmm. itself. And, yeah, like, my upbringing my mom is Dominican, my dad is Arubian. So what I'm accustomed to is could be totally yeah, different from, yeah, for sure. to you. Yeah. And then the fact that we could sit here and just talk about like, oh, I used to, my mother used to make me this and correct, this and correct. that. And I was like, oh yeah, my mother used to make me that. I think that's part of the beauty of Caribbean too because um, the, the diversity in, in, a, in, a, in something we share in common, case in point planting. <laughs> the many different ways <laughs> you know you could use it exactly. besides just as a side i don't know if you ever had it something i love yeah you could make planting porridge <laughs> planting porridge yeah well you teach me something <laughs> <laughs> can't teach her to make it though i could <laughs> put you in touch with my mom <laughs> but you know and 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 even the different ways we, which we fry it you know um like the melon pizze mm -hmm. or your regular you know so so yeah or you can boil it and have it with provision, you know, in that sense. So just to show, you know, the, all the different things we can we can do with it. Yeah, like, for instance, like, when I was working in Germany and, you know, I would request certain ingredients just to see how I could add to the menu. And a lot of people never touch a mango in their life. Wow. Don't know how it works. Tantin, too. This is like, wow. Well, <laughs> the first time So they're basically a, blown away. Yeah, first yeah. time eating a tostones, they're like, Wow. Is this <laughs> and it's like a common snack for us. Right? So, like, yeah. a lot of these things that we just, like, take for granted, like a Johnny cake and stuff like that. Ooh, yeah. A lot of people can go their life not having that. And it's just like, yo, I'm really glad that I have just such a rich culinary background. Mm -hmm. And to be able to bring that to a space where a lot of people have not experienced it kind of gives me this, like, one-up niche, in my opinion. Yeah. Like, hey, you know. Yeah. 
have something I'm different. I'm special. Yeah, yeah but you're definitely so. right. That's for sure. And um, even from a professional standpoint as well, what's your take on the culinary offerings here on, here on the island? Take on my culinary offerings. Um, so <laughs> I have to I have to confess, I've been eating quite a lot the past few weeks, <laughs> just okay. trying to dibble and dabble. And I must say, there's quite a lot, and I see a lot of people trying to venture off and do different things. Um, I've seen a lot of people doing the chicken and waffles. I've seen a lot of people just trying to mimic those things that, like, when I go back to the Netherlands, I see on a daily basis, mm -hmm. which I really get excited about. But I hope that doesn't mean that we lose our, like, basics, you know? Yeah, I got you saying. Mm -hmm. So that's why when uh, Hurricane Irma happened and people started cooking more, doing more food sales with local food I was like okay that's cool I like that I like that but then you have this reverse effect where it's just like okay a lot of people doing the same, the same thing. thing yeah so uh, for someone with me with culinary as my profession that gives me the challenge of like okay how do I come back yeah and create something different but still like Familiar. Familiar. As, uh, going back to what you were saying, <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah. My whole process of just yes. creation. So, yes. Yeah. I love it, but then it's just like, ooh, you put me in a hard spot. But yeah, that that's what pushes you to become a better chef, true, you know? True. Yeah, and from experience, you know, um, I can really say just as long as you have a solid product, you're good. Mm -hmm. You know, honestly, you know, it will sell itself, of course. <clears throat> considering it, what we discussed in the beginning with service and making sure consistency and all those exactly. and, and those factor but um you know as, as long as you you do have that solid product and in your case um you will definitely stand out <laughs> <laughs> for you. sure for sure um so i can imagine i guess that's that's one thing in the back of your mind probably um wondering what it would be like uh coming back home if you decide to of course um yeah and open up whether it's a restaurant or a catering service etc that would be semantic but unique yeah yeah no yeah that's where i'm <clears throat> sitting down thinking like how do i go about it because my parents they do have a catering company yeah so i don't want that to just be sitting there so i think and like okay how do i come back and just revolutionize Catering, yeah. you know, everybody yeah. they're doing the traditional Caribbean snacks and yes, stuff like and the that. Yes, the croquettes, the, the croquettes, the yeah. uh, devil eggs, etc. Yeah. Yeah. So how do how can I push that to the next level? And then now, um, with me now taking on this more broad managerial restaurant tour mm -hmm. mindset, now I think like, okay, how can I step in more into like restaurant consultancy? You mm. know be able like to that. help on the service side of it too because I had a conversation with a gentleman who's very into the food scene and that was what he was explaining to like a lot of people ended up cooking the same things and stuff like that so you kind of lose that like service quality mm -hmm. it's very more like take and go yes yep you know? yep yep very true, very true. and like especially uh, that was bolstered by, um, well, understandably, the the, 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 the pandemic. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's like, hey, just take your food and, and leave. Yeah. Exactly. And then also, too, yeah, like, you're losing a lot of people within this industry because, yeah, working, climate, also not being paid enough. So, yeah, trying to build back that credibility when it comes to, like, genuine service within this is industry is something that really had me, like, okay, like, I'm getting this uh, um, education where I'm just like working in front of the house. I'm dealing with people. I'm learning how to gauge what they expect mm -hmm. from service. And then if I can bring this and bring it over here, like, why not? Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's what I'm looking into, too. So. And I just want to add, you know, to anyone, uh, especially persons of influence listening to this program, 
don't hesitate to reach out to Tracy. She may be a little <laughs> shy, but she's power packed. Uh, and that's part of the reason why I do this program too, of course. So, uh, of course, talk about issues on the island, but uh, to showcase, you know, our professionals, um, young and old, um, on St. Martin, because we got a lot of great minds um, like yourself. And I uh, really appreciate the insights that you're, you're sharing as well. Um, so, I think I asked a question, but I'll. But, but uh, access still, which is, uh, do you have a signature meal by any chance? And how do you, um, uh, how do you uh, look towards creating one? Signature meal. <laughs> I wouldn't say I have a signature meal, but um, <laughs> this is like an inside joke. Like um, at work, I'm pretty sure that people who work in the industry knows like family meal is kind of a thing where like you have this period in time during the day where you come together, you make a meal for the staff, you sit down, kind of like de-stress, have something to eat, fuel you up for the rest of the day ahead. And um, I really took it upon myself to kind of dedicate staff meal to where I was just like, okay, you know what, I'm cooking for my work farm, so I'm going to put my all into it. And usually it's just like, you know, what I would want to eat after a long day or to get me pumped. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> my coworker said, like, I don't know why, but you are so good in making, like, slutty food. Like, <laughs> bad for you food, but so good and so nice. And I was just like, okay, I guess that was my... Yeah. My <laughs> and that reminds me, of, I guess you probably heard of the slutty vegan. Yes. Yeah, and, and now how... how booming how they are booming right now in um, exactly. atlanta yeah yeah like that's she's like one of my role models so i was just like yeah, she's bad she good yeah like, well i mean bad isn't good yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah she she's good yeah so like i mean even though like the pictures that i post on instagram is very like a lot of people tell me it's art it's refined but i also love like a good like made burger mm. chicken and waffles i used to be a head chef for a chicken and waffles place so nice. that's that's one thing too I, I just love yeah making like slutty food gotcha tastes good so well i'm just saying tracy you know um you, you may have to head back to the netherlands but uh people that might may bring you back home yeah, yeah. <laughs> just uh, go ahead and do your pop-up and uh let's let's see what, what what happens from there yes yes we will make sure that uh you know um that local support that um is vital is there and i think you already have that i think that's a great thing too for sure Definitely. Um, so a final question I have um, is, uh, well, touchy maybe, a little. But one thing I was definitely curious about is uh, what was it like living with basically your own history teacher? <laughs> Ooh, um, <laughs> well, my uh, experience living with a living, breathing uh history book was I would have to say pretty normal like at the end of the day that was just my dad mm -hmm. you know I could remember multiple times where I would ask him like hey dad a question about this 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 his first re response would be like you see those encyclopedias grab it and look for the information and I was like but dad like you have all the answers like why can't you just tell me he's just like exactly how I Got invest it. the time to go looking take that time and if you have any questions come and ask me so basically that's how <laughs> my gotcha. dad was okay but um yeah i must say it's just i've just been looking at him at all all the things that he's done and yeah sad fact is like i can't be able to witness that but i know that he left such a great blueprint mm -hmm. and it's just figuring out, out how am I going to fill these gaps and I mean he's left a lot for me to work with so it's my it's just so basic. true to form basically yeah yeah right <laughs> that's true to form so it's just basically how I could do it in a way that serves him justice yeah so well I can definitely say um, he's certainly proud and he was certainly proud because he talked about you very often as well Thanks. Yes. So, Tracy, I'd like to thank you so much for coming to the program. Any final words you'd like to share? I just have to say, like, anybody who pursuing something that they love, just keep on at it. Even though, you know, you're going to hit some snags along the way. You're going to have people who ain't going to believe in 
your vision, just keep on at it. And you know, you're gonna reap the fruits of your labor one day. So just keep on at it, don't quit. Thank you, very, po very powerful words. And with that, thank you folks for joining us on today's program. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow. Take care.